Hey there, students. Tom Ritchie here and kicking off our live AP U.S. History review series for the 2021 AP U.S. History exam. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to go down to uh, the description and click on the Crowdcast link, okay? If you want to be involved in our ongoing live review, the best thing to do is going to be to sign up for the Crowdcast course and come on in, and that way you're going to get notifications when I'm going live in advance. Now, I do plan to do, with one exception, when I'm on spring break in a couple weeks, uh, these review sessions are going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern, okay? So you can count on that if you just want to watch on YouTube, 9 p.m. Eastern um, on uh, YouTube, and that's going to be um, AP U.S. History Review. So thank y'all for, uh, you know, for supporting this project and all of that, uh, all of that kind of stuff there. Um, so with that, uh, also there's some information on Marco Learning Student Support. So you definitely want to be a part of this ongoing review experience. So I would definitely encourage you to go to the Crowdcast. Now, we're going to do uh, a little broadcast tonight, uh, you know, on uh, the so-called Unit 1, period 1, 1491 to 1607. Okay, so we're going to do a few things tonight. Um, this is going to be a shorter session because this is just sort of a kickoff. I haven't even gotten your, uh, you know, you haven't even gotten your teachers notified about this or anything like that. I usually like to do the first session kind of low key, kind of see who shows up. So if y'all show up, y'all got any questions, y'all go ahead and come join us. Um, I sure appreciate that. Means the world, right? Um, and so with that, uh, we will go ahead and let's uh, delve into, now I have got not only a YouTube lecture on Native American cultures, uh, but I've also got uh, some blog notes. So I'm going to show y'all where we can come up with some things here. Make sure that you're familiar with resources um, for uh, you know Native American cultures for AP US history. Okay, so starting uh, starting with this, now just note you can search for Native American cultures A push, and it can take you to the uh, you know to the lecture, or it can take you to my website where I've got some blog notes here. And a few things that we want to do here. Now you can watch the full lecture, but I'm going to go ahead and go in just a few things that we want to note here. Now, first of all, Native Americans were diverse. Okay. So you want to get rid of any kind of single stereotypical image that you may have in your own mind that represents all Native Americans. Now you can see on my video thumbnail, I've got those teepees. Um, not all of them lived in teepees. You know, in this sense, this is, I think, one of the stereotypes that, you know, where people imagine, uh, you know, all natives on as, you know, on the plains, you know, in migratory villages where they're picking up and they're following the herds. This isn't necessarily the case. You want to be familiar with the different, uh, you know, I lost my breath there, what happened? Um, but with all of the different regions and how those regions, uh, you know, had different cultures uh, within them. Now, what you want to note here, and, you know, nice little plug for uh, Romulus, uh, push review just a little trivia app uh would love to uh for you to get a hold of that so just remember uh romulus is always there for you um when you're looking for uh you know when you're looking for something to help you review so with that we want to note that there are different language and culture groups over 150 distinct ethnic groups and at least 10 broadly characterized culture groups now each tribal group is interacting differently with its environment. So we want to note these sustainability practices and that we see all of these different environmental interactions. So with that, this is largely based on uh, when we're thinking about these culture groups. So when you're looking here in the Arctic and subarctic, a lot of hunting and fishing, not a lot of agriculture. But then as you're looking here um, in the Southeast, there's hunting and farming, same in the Northeast, really hunting, gathering, farming, um, people that are on the coast, they're going to be fishing, okay? That's one of the things that you can also see in, uh, you know, in California out here on the ocean, okay? You're going to see fishing out here. Um, so with that, you want to think about just a few of these places. Now, note, even in the Southwest, one thing we want to note is that Southwestern uh, Indians, they had a very uh, you know, very advanced irrigation techniques for growing corn in the desert. Uh, so with that, noting and then noting on the Great Plains, 
hunting, okay? And this is something that's influenced by the Colombian Exchange, okay? When we're thinking about the Colombian Exchange, uh, you know, that we're seeing that horses are coming in from Europe and these horses are being used by natives on the Great Plains, okay? So with that, I typically divide them into, uh, you know, we see Arctic Plains, Northeast and Great Lakes, Southwest and Southeast, okay? Um, not so much on the Arctic uh, necessarily, but, uh, and then also you don't necessarily need to know each particular tribe, but it would be good to have that specific evidence. You know, if you're writing an LEQ or something like that, the Iroquois um, in the Northeast or on the Great Lakes or something like that. So looking at that, you've got the Great Plains, you know, where we've got bison hunters, they're migratory and also remember they're riding horses uh, introduced from Europe okay so this is something that we're seeing as part of the Colombian exchange and so with that uh, you know we can see here now also there are tribes that are the exception you know you see the Wichita tribe here that they're basically growing corn and they're trading corn for bison meat okay when you go out into the northeast now remember this is where you're going to run into settled agriculture and particularly slash and burn agriculture, not European style agriculture with a plow, but agriculture where, you know, they are going to kind of move from place to place. Like they'll live in one place, but they'll cultivate land for some years and then they'll move to some other land some other time. Okay. And so going from there, uh, you know, the three sisters, corn, squash, beans, and they're growing these all around each other. So it's not like European agriculture where we've got this crop here, this crop here, we're plowing the fields. Note that Indian women are the ones that are uh, doing the agricultural labor. So that's something that you can note where gender roles are a little bit different uh, with natives and with uh, you know European colonists. And so going from there, you've got the Iroquois Longhouse, uh, you know, that the Iroquois Confederation is here in, uh, mo you know, in modern day New York. Now, another thing we want to note is that, you know, like Europeans, natives engaged in intertribal warfare and Europeans, uh, you know, pick sides in these uh, in these. Uh, fights. Now, also, we want to note that natives were not without agency. One thing that we want to note here is that the natives are not always being acted upon. Okay, there are times when native tribes are using these, uh, you know, these European um, competitors against each other and to their advantage. And especially where we see the French, they have very warm relationships with their Indian allies. So when we go into the South Southwest, that's where we're going to see clay houses, cliff dwellings, and maize or corn agriculture. Okay. Um, and so with this, uh, you know, we see, uh, you know, a Hopi Indian apartment complex. Uh, then we've got cliff dwellings and there's the cliff palace. Okay. So some interesting things there. Now the Southeast, the Southeast is a place that is, that's where I'm from here. We're known for agriculture. OK, so agriculture um, and settled communities. Now, another thing to note, uh, because this is 1491, this class technically starts before European contact. So hundreds of years before European contact outside of St. Louis, we see these uh, large burial mounds, the Cahokia mounds, because this Cahokia was a large city um, that had thousands of people. This is uh, an artist rendition of what it might have looked like. So with that, uh, you want to take a look at the Native American cultures, but also taking a look at European contact. All right, CVD's here. Good to see you over here. And uh, is there any way we can access the slides? App? Yeah, so the stream will, uh, this is something as far as this goes, the stream is going to be available afterwards. This is not going to simply disappear um, after it's over, okay? So what I want to do here is we want to note as well um, the
Okay, so let's see what we've uh, what we've got uh, what we've got here. Uh, this is something where, of course, this looks like it may be. Well, hmm. Um, I think this is a Marco Learning World History Study Guide pack. Um, but the you know the Colombian Exchange is something that you're going to need for a push for AP Euro and AP World. I would say that the Colombian Exchange is one of the things that you're going to need for all of those uh, all of those classes. Like all three AP History classes are going to go into the Colombian Exchange. So the Colombian Exchange, this is this exchange that we see happening as a result of Columbus's voyages. Now note, uh, a lot of people say, well, Columbus did didn't technically discover America. That was the Vikings. Um, and then so, you know, the thing is, though, Columbus's voyages started a permanent relationship, a permanent trade relationship between the old world and the new world, between the Americas, Europe, and Africa. And so what we're going to see here is we see a lot of products that are going uh, back and forth here. Now, you don't want to get in the frame of mind where you're trying to get like all of these at once, okay? You don't want to try to remember all of them. Now, a few things, you can note livestock, okay? Because in the Americas, they didn't keep livestock. Uh, there wasn't this, you know, idea of like go out into the pasture and slaughter a cow or a sheep or a goat or something like that. But it is about, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, just go hunt something. Okay. So they didn't have livestock, like basically food that's being, you know, be live food that's being grown to kill. So we want to note that a lot of diseases coming from the old world. Um, and then of course, uh, the new world possibly sending syphilis back, uh, you know, but other than that, all of the other diseases just about coming from um, the old world. Now, what I like to uh, think about is I like to pick a couple of things. Okay. So what I will note here is uh, I always like to mention potatoes and tomatoes. Okay. So potatoes and tomatoes, these are new world native plants. Now, what I like to think about is, can you imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes? Can you imagine French cuisine? without potatoes or even like, you know, English fish and chips kind of thing. So potatoes and tomatoes, they rhyme. And also we see that these are impactful things. Okay. So when we think about this, potatoes and tomatoes fundamentally changed, uh, you know, cuisine in a lot of European, uh, you know, European countries. Um, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's what we're, uh, you know, what we're seeing there. Um, so potatoes and tomatoes, that's something that I like to uh, like to note there. Um, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, you know, we see here that there are also when you think about like bananas. OK, so bananas are a crop that grow very they grow very well in Central America, but they're not native to Central America. So when you look at like bananas and citrus fruits, uh, those are crops that came from the old world and they're going to the new world where they end up thriving. OK, so as far as uh, as far as that goes now, remember also that that the Colombian exchange is also about ideas. Okay. So the Colombian exchange is all about ideas. Um, so that's something we think about things like Christianity and capitalism. So when the Spanish and the French are sending missionaries, um, this is also the case here. Okay. So when we think about, uh, let's see, Hey, Talia, Talia's here. Okay. We got, uh, the crew is being assembled. You know, I'm thinking like Ron Burgundy, like news team assemble. All right. So, uh, so with that, uh, you know, we've got uh, Queen, uh, you know, Queen Isabella. Yeah. So when we're thinking about that. Let's talk a little bit about the French and the Spanish. Yes, I know. I know we've got uh, those movies in common and such. So great that people understand those uh, those references there. Uh, you know, did we just become best friends? You know, which most of y'all don't get it. Y'all need to watch Step Brothers, kids. All right. So as far as that uh, goes, let's go ahead and get into, let's get into uh, New Spain and New France and some other things things we'll say for the next broadcast. And be sure to tell your friends, like I said, I typically do the first review broadcast with low promotion, um, but you know we'll be letting teachers know about this series and all that. So definitely uh, let your friends know that we're here and I'm going to be here every
every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern, okay? And remember, those of y'all who are watching on YouTube, be sure to click the link for Crowdcast. Um, there, oh, <laughs> General Kenobi. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, somebody actually uh, in the YouTube chat as General Grievous. Okay, which uh, you're do yeah you're uh, yeah. So with that, <laughs> oh my goodness, that's great. That just for whatever reason just never gets old for me. Okay, so let's go into New Spain and New France, and we will uh, you know probably um, call it a day in a little bit because this is kind of our first time. And uh, oh, is there a real trailer that's come out for Kenobi? Because I've seen like, you know, homemade trailers and stuff like that. But uh, okay. Kenobi trailer official. Okay. So, uh, okay. I did not know that. Okay. So as far as that, okay. So we actually have a teaser trailer um, for Kenobi, which I don't need to be putting copyrighted material there. No, 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 no. Okay. So uh, wait, this came out in October. Is this, wait, what is that? Is that for real? Okay, so I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna figure it out. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, yeah, <laughs> we don't want. Oh, AJ is here as well. Okay, so yeah, I don't want to get demonetized. That's like, oh my goodness, not you know the demonetization police. Okay, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm um, getting into New Spain. Okay, so we see that now. We want to know when we look at the European colonizers. One of the things that we want to focus on is where. Where were these colonizers? Okay, so the Spanish are in the American Southwest and in, uh, you know, Spanish Florida. Okay, and so with that, you see here the Reconquista. The Spanish really are seeing their empire being uh, expanded here. So when we look at the Spanish Reconquista, uh, you know, we see Spanish Christians reconquering Muslim-held Spain, and they have just done this in 1492, the same year that they are sending Columbus, right, to sail the ocean blue, so to speak. So we want to remember Ferdinand and Isabella. They are the Catholic monarchs. They completed the Reconquista, God, glory, and gold. Not necessarily in that order, okay? Because the conquistadors, all right? These are, the, of course, a Spanish word for conqueror, all right? So the conquistadors, uh, they came, uh, you know, conquering. And we see that uh, Cortes conquered the Aztec Empire. Now, the Aztec Empire was, uh, you know, basically a feudal tribute. Tributary, tributary state, um, they had conquered all of these other natives, uh, you know, which one thing, the Spanish get a bad rap, um, but then the Aztecs weren't such great people either. You know, if you were conquered by the Spanish here, uh, you probably weren't being treated much differently than you were the first time. But then, you know, the Spanish, you know, typically will, uh, you know, will, you know, we're looking at them. They did not have such nice relations with the natives as the French did. Okay. Um, so there is now another thing that we see here in modern day Mexico City um, is Tenochtitlan. Okay. Which was the Aztec capital, a very, you know, wealthy and prosperous city here. And so New Spain, you know, basically, you know, just they got lots of land. Okay. Now, so we want to note, uh, you know, the caste system of New Spain where you've got, you know, two things that are being decided here um, is what was your blood and where you where were you born? OK, so you've got here where were you born and what is your uh, you know, what what is your bloodline? Now, you notice here the Peninsularis, these People who were born in Spain are seen as, you know, more, uh, you know, more important on the caste ladder than people who are full-blooded Spanish, but Creoles, they're the ones who were born there, um, that are born in the colonies. Now, this is going to kind of echo, even though it's not going to be so institutionalized, um, in the American colonies, certainly we're going to see this where the British think that they are somehow better than us, okay? So that's going to be something that we're going to um, see again, again, not so formalized, but it's going to be in practice. Like, you know, nobody is ever going to consider George Washington um, to be an equal in terms of being British, uh, you know, in, in that sense, you know, even though he's got plenty of money. Okay. Oh, what's going on? Never mind. I need to 
turned mm -hmm. my speaker off for whatever reason. I turned my speaker on and then it started doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so with that, the encomienda, we want to remember the system of forced labor and tribute um, that exists in the Spanish. Now, again, this isn't fundamentally different than what was going on under the Aztecs. But at the same time, uh, you know, you got people like Bartolome de las Casas who came over originally as an encomendero and uh, this Dominican priest uh, who then decides to become an advocate for the natives. And he is uh, writing about these abuses of the Spanish encomienda system. Now, Bartolome de las Casas is always an interesting source because certainly we're not going to call him a liar or that he was deliberately misrepresenting anything. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it was certainly to his advantage to write down things as he heard them, um, to represent the Spanish in the worst possible light because he was trying to get reforms done. Okay, so there is some, uh, you know, some when we're looking at this source, some discussion about you know, to what extent uh, is this seen as like an accurate source in terms of um, the Spanish and the natives? Now, nobody's going to argue that the Spanish were saints. But then again, you've got this so-called, you know, black legend of the Spanish and just all that they're doing is just abusing uh, natives and feeding babies to dogs and that sort of thing. And, you know, that's not, uh, you know, not really an accurate portrayal of how this was day to day. But then again, you know, you're not going to have any, you know, a lot of candidates for sainthood or something like that. Maybe, you know, our friend Bartolome, um, but certainly not your average encomendero. So uh, we see here that the Spanish eventually reformed the encomienda. Now, the Spanish were also very much uh, involved in trying to um, Christianize the native population and get them to adopt the Spanish language. So Spanish missions um, that we see See here to assimilate uh, the native population, uh, to, you know, for them to become proper subjects of the Spanish Empire. Um, building Spanish missions just all over the place. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I always like to look at European colonizers from a quote from Patton: "Leave me, follow me, or get out of my way." Um, where when we look at this graphic organizer here, the Spanish. Um, what were they colonizing? They're colonizing Mexico, California, the Southwest United States, Florida. Um, they're Catholic. Interested parties would be conquistadors and priests. Their primary economic activity, okay, being conquest and labor. Their settlements, missions are, uh, you know, great examples of Spanish settlements. There weren't a lot of Spanish colonists coming over. Um, evangelism. Now, what we want to note here, sure, Every European colonizer is, is sending missionaries, but the French and the Spanish, they have an organized program of evangelism that is sponsored by the government, whereas with the English and the Dutch, it's going to be more piecemeal. Um, so with this advice to the natives, follow me. The Spanish want the natives to follow them. And with that, uh, you know, I have a website in case y'all weren't aware of that already. Let's see if we've got any questions in Crowdcast. I want to talk about, uh, you know, I want to talk about New Spain and possibly, uh, you know, possibly New Netherland. All right. So as far as that, Ava Vicky is here. Now, y'all remember, y'all can ask a question. We've got some of y'all here in Crowdcast. Remember those of you who are in the YouTube chat, make sure that you uh, you know, that you go into, uh, yeah, AP Euro was at eight. Sorry, I originally had a nine o'clock start time for that. For some reason, I accidentally put that. But A push is going to be at nine. Euro is going to be at eight on Monday nights from now to the exam, uh, with the exception of my uh, spring break in a couple weeks. So with this, point out real quick, oh, the thumbnail says AP Euro. Okay, got it, got it. I did not change the thumbnail here. Let me see if I'm able to run it here and uh, you know yeah I don't know what uh, what I need to do with that so I will figure all that out um, thank y'all for uh, thank y'all for that so going uh, going from this yeah I do need to make a little edit there thank y'all so much that I just forgot to change the uh, the thumbnail but I will get on that um, so going with that yeah, so we will be uh, we will be getting uh, getting into that soon. Okay, so going from there, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's see what are we what are we doing here? All right, so wait, what? 
Okay, I just need to uh, do something real quick here. All right, so going from that, let's see, uh, let's see where we are here. So let's go into New France. All right, so we're going to go into New France and let's go ahead and share the screen again. Okay, so we've got the Spanish. Now let's take a quick look at the French. Okay, now the French you can think of as like the friendly French. Okay, the French definitely have a friendly relationship um, with the natives, but then again, just like we said that the natives, uh, you know, they lived based on the environments they encountered. It's the same with the French, okay? Because when the French come in, the French are, you know, taking land here in, uh, you know, present day Canada, the Great Lakes, and in the Mississippi River Valley, all the way down to Louisiana. And so what's happening here is, you know, you've got a lot of territorial claims, but very few areas of actual settlement and very few colonists. The French are focusing on the fur trade, all right? So we see here that the French largely are making money here on the fur trade. Now that is going to make the French, uh, you know, more focused on the exchange, okay? So we're going to see here that, you know, you're going to need allies here, that the fur trade is not a forced labor kind of situation, it's an exchange, okay? So the French have a friendlier relationship with the natives because their economic motives are based on consensual exchanges, consensual and voluntary exchanges. Now, French traders would often, uh, you know, marry um, into, uh, you know, they, they marry native women because that helped uh, them to uh, do better in the fur trade. You know, they're, they're building these kinship networks. Now, also, we want to note that just like the Spanish, the French sent very few colonists, okay? So another thing here is the French are also Catholic. Now, instead of setting up missions and getting the natives to pay taxes and to learn Spanish, the French Jesuit priest would actually learn the native languages. Um, so that's something that we're seeing here that the French Jesuits learn the native languages and they live among the natives and they're getting more voluntary and authentic conversions here. Um, so leave me, follow me or get out of my way. Um, the French, they are, um, you know, here in Canada, the Great Lakes and quote unquote Louisiana, like the Spanish, they are Catholic fur traders and priests rather than uh, conquistadors and priests. Primary economic activity, they're in the fur trade. Um, their settlements are trading posts. Few colonists, just like the Spanish. Um, yes, there's an organized program of evangelism. Those of you who were at AP Euro last year, you don't think that Louis XIV uh, would miss an opportunity to create new Catholics, right? Make sure none of them turn into Huguenots or anything like that. And advice to the natives, lead me. We want to learn to do things like you because we want to be friendly and we want you to trade with us. Um, so when we're looking at this, you know, the Spanish and the French certainly have some things in common. The French and the Spanish are both Catholic. Um, they're both sending priests. Um, they're both sending few colonists. But at the same time, we have different economic pursuits and a different relationship with the natives. OK, so as far as that goes, make sure that you're ready to compare the French and the Spanish. You know, that'd be a great like SAQ or a great, uh, you know, LEQ for those of you who are going to take the paper pencil exam uh, that, you know, they are both Catholic evangelism and they're both trying to make money. But then we see here that, uh, you know, there are differences in the interactions between the French and the Spanish. Now, again, uh, that's what we've got there. And unless we've got any new questions that I'm going to see here, um, we are going to now, especially if y'all are here in the crowdcast, that means that we have got um, a... Uh, you know, that you're going to get notifications of when these things go live. I will be doing a push review at nine o'clock p.m. on all these. OK, so, yeah, I'm certainly, uh, you know, happy to help. And thank you, Abigail, for pointing out that my, you know, yeah, I need to make sure that I've got uh, a push over here on the YouTube stream. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching. Again, I'm going to be back uh, for lengthier reviews. I'm going to let all the teachers know, you know, I'll say here's the link and all of that kind of stuff. 
So we like to do this low key. I love, uh, you know, where we've, uh, you know, we've got like the crew here, like in the crowd cast, like this is certifiably the crew. Okay. I mean, it's, it's just great to see this, uh, this group here. And I'm just uh, so glad y'all are here. So looking forward to helping y'all prepare for yet uh, another exam. Yep. CBD, you are part of the crew as is Viviki. And uh, it is always a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen.